oh my God, did he just tell me to exercise more and eat less? He even wrote it on a whiteboard. Oh, like I, at first I was kind of ashamed. I had kind of that flush of shame. And then I realized, whoa, millions of women are being told this very same thing and it's wrong. It is wrong. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sarah. How are you? I'm great, Lisa. Happy to be here. Oh my God, I'm so excited. You state that hormones and food are, and women are the most misunderstood things. So that's where I really want to start because as a kid, I was taught a lot of things, I was told a lot of things, and it's not now until my 40s that I actually realized how much of that wasn't true, how much I was told that was the opposite. And so that's where I really want to start is let's talk about what are the things that are very specifically misunderstood. Love to start there. I feel like so many of us grow up in a way that we're told that hormones, our mood, our weight is a problem. And I think it's so important for us to, to own it, not under someone else's terms, but under our own terms. And often it's not until we're 35 or 40 that we start to realize that we were told the wrong things as we were growing up. I love that. So when you say own it, um, what, what does that actually look like then? Because there's one thing, in fact, that you've spoken about that I'd never heard about, but gaslighting with doctors. Like, I'd never heard of that. So take me through that. And do you think that that's part of the recognizing and then owning it? It is part of owning it. You know, what I see with a lot of my patients is that they struggle with something. So that could be depression, anxiety, it could be that they have painful periods, like when they're a teenager. It could be that um, they're struggling to lose weight, maybe after a kid, or they're struggling with their gut. They go to their doctor and explain what's going on, and they get maybe minimally tested. The doctor then says, you're fine, go home. But you're just getting older. And so that's how the gaslighting happens. I think it happens with so many things that women experience. And I'm not saying it's intentional on the part right. of the clinicians, but it's, it's a way that we start to doubt ourselves. We start to doubt our truth. We start to doubt our power mm. to manage some of these problems that we're facing. Whatever you're experiencing is your truth. And you don't need a doctor to validate that for you. I think it starts with that. So, you know, I, I think, for instance, about women who have painful periods. Like, I had painful periods when I was a teenager. I was offered a birth control pill when I was 16. And I did go on the pill, but no one explained to me the risks of going on the pill. And we, we've known that there's a lot of different risks. So I think the first part is learning for yourself before you take a medication what some of those risks are. Because I can tell you from going through conventional training as a physician that we're not taught to give full informed consent. So I think informed consent is one piece. If we just take the birth control pill, which is like a super juicy topic, mm -hmm. I think, for, for our listeners, mm -hmm. you know, it's associated with increasing inflammation in the body. It sort of creates this frat party in the body that I think you need to know about. It increases one of the markers that we track called C-reactive protein. That's an indication of whether your immune system is kind of overactive. It also can hurt the gut. It can hurt the microbiome. And we know that the birth control pill harms the balance of the good bacteria and the bad bacteria, something called dysbiosis. It can also affect leaky gut. It can cause your gut to be more leaky. And then that sets you up to be at greater risk for food intolerances. And um, it increases the risk of Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease. And then in terms of hormones, which I really want to talk about today, it decreases your testosterone. So who gets told that when they get started on a birth control pill? So testosterone is one of those hormones, Lisa, that I want every woman to know about because we think of it as a male hormone, mm. but the truth is, we are exquisitely sensitive to it. So even though we've got 10 to 20 times less testosterone than men, it's this hormone that's involved in confidence, agency, risk-taking. It's involved in these other things too that most people know about, sex drive, muscle mass. But I think that part where it can erode your confidence and it can erode your sense of empowerment, 
That's the part that really troubles me about women getting started on the pill and not getting full informed consent. First of all, feel validated with whatever symptoms that you're having. If you have a doctor who's dismissing you or who's saying, you know, it doesn't sound like it's a serious problem, your labs are fine, go home, you know, I don't want to hear from you, that's not the right doctor for you. Mm. So I think finding a collaborative clinician is such an important part of this and standing up for yourself. So if your doctor's saying, you know, take this Xanax or take this birth control pill or, you know, how about this antidepressant? You got to realize that there's this whole world of integrative medicine, functional medicine, precision medicine that allows us to go so much deeper to understand the root cause and address the root cause rather than masking the symptoms, which is what we've been doing for women for 100 plus years. Oh, God, I was like, I didn't want to interrupt you. That was so amazing. There were so many good things in there. Um, so I love that I, I'm not looking to blame doctors. I am not looking yeah. to say it's their fault. Yeah. They, everyone has the ability to act how they want. So if a doctor turns to me and says, here, here's a pill, I don't think of it in my head, at least, as it being malice. It's, hey, my education and where I am today tells me that I should be giving you this. And going back to the ownership thing, it is the thing that changed my life, girl, was the fact I then took ownership over it. That even though the doctor gave me antibiotics and said to me, hey, I probably shouldn't give you this many. For years, I blamed the doctor. He gave me too many antibiotics and that's why I had gut issues. But the truth is, I never once said, why? I never once said, hang on a minute. Before I put this in my mouth, I wasn't force fed the antibiotics. Before I put it in, I should do my research. Before I put it, you know, I've got this like weird instinct. They keep saying it, but he keeps giving it to me. I never once took action. And once I started to take action, once I started to realize, oh, if this is my fault, responsibility, ownership, whatever word some people like to use, now I can do something about it. So I think you actually listed things like inflammation is so powerful because some people don't, I never would have associated my hormones being out of whack with inflammation. So you even said stress. So what are a few other things that we can start to now talk about and highlight that if someone's listening, they go, oh my God, could this be a hormone thing? And this whole time I thought it was because, you know, the TV was too loud every evening and that's why I've got a headache. Like what are those things that we can say, okay, if this happens, then maybe you have a hormone issue and then we can take it to the next step of what we can then slowly do about it. Of course. So, you know, with hormones, the list is long. So hormones drive everything that you're interested in, Lisa. So they're involved in so many different things. They're involved in the stress response. Mm. And what I see with so many of my patients, especially type A women, is that we've got too much of a cortisol load. We've mm. got just like too much cortisol flying through our bodies. And these hormones are a little hierarchical, meaning that cortisol is kind of like the bully <laughs> in the body. So it is a higher priority than some of the other hormones like estrogen, okay. progesterone, testosterone. So if cortisol is out of whack, it's gonna pull some of the other hormones offline, mm -hmm. including the thyroid. So thyroid's especially involved in metabolism. If we just talk about cortisol first and what some of those symptoms are, yeah. you can feel fatigue. You can feel tired but wired, kind of a weird paradoxical combination. You can feel uh, like you've got more belly fat. So we know that cortisol receptors are four times higher on belly fat compared to fat elsewhere. So you kind of unfortunately build more belly fat when cortisol is high. It's associated with mood issues. So depression, half of people with depression have high cortisol. Are we checking those people for mm. cortisol levels? No. And yet that's one of the things that we could address and something we do address in functional precision and integrative medicine as a first line for dealing with moodiness and, and depressed uh, feelings. So if we take the thyroid as an example, it's involved in hair loss. Mm -hmm. It's involved in um, feeling like your energy is good throughout the day, kind of consistent energy. It's involved in cold hands and cold feet. So if you're someone who has to wear socks to bed, definitely want to check the thyroid. Interesting. It's involved in... Um, puffiness. So some people have kind of this increased fluid retention that can be associated with thyroid. It can also be associated with progesterone. 
And all of these hormones influence the gut. So with thyroid, for instance, if you're low in thyroid function, like I was in my 30s, mm -hmm. that can be associated with constipation. If you've got too much thyroid hormone, that can make you uh, have a loose stool and be pooping more. I talk a lot about poop. I hope that's okay, Lisa. Oh, I, I want to get down to the real shit, <laughs> pun intended, I guess. Um, because that's the thing. I went, and not to interrupt you, but just to give an example why this is important. When I was 16, I was very restricted dieting. I had a very bad relationship with food. I wasn't going for six days. And I thought it was normal. Because I didn't realize, it's not like me and my friends were all hanging out talking about poop. We were talking about boys. So I literally had no idea that not going, having a bowel movement for six days was abnormal. Please go down that rabbit hole. I'm not squeamish. Well, this is so important because I think, you know, just as you were describing at age 16, there's a way that our culture tells girls to shut up about our bodies, mm -hmm. to, um, be as thin as possible, to take up as, as little space as possible, and to be obedient. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that comes from medicine being mostly run by men. And I'm not, again, I'm not blaming the men sure. because I was part of the system, but I, I think there's a way that our own feelings about our body and even feeling kind of clogged up and not pooping for a long period of time, we're just not, it's not considered normal mm -hmm. to talk about it. So I wanna undo that. I think that's really important. We've gotta change the conversation that women are having about their bodies and about our health. And to realize that so much of what we struggle with, whether that's energy or confidence or our weight or our gut function, so much of it is related to hormones and hormone balance. I don't want people to wait until they're in their 40s mm -hmm. to really care about this and to realize how important it is to you serving your mission in the world because metabolism and the way that your hormones are supporting you, that's like the wind at your back when it comes to the mission that you have in the world. Mm -hmm. Whatever that mission is, you know, whether it's a nonprofit or you know, a charitable organization or you wanna you know, change the way hormones are tested, you're entrepreneurial, whether you are taking care of a dog that you love, whatever that mission is, we need those hormones to be supporting us. So true, and I th you even started with this, is that for me, I always thought hormones meant your period and your mood, that was it. So once I started to think about confidence, once I started to think about, I can feel better about myself just by looking at how my hormones are and what I'm eating and how I'm, you know, what I'm doing to my lifestyle, things like that. I was like, oh my God, this is, this is like saying to me, hey, you've got a magic superpower and you've never used it and how I'm gonna tell you now how to tap into it. Like that's so amazing and that's why, like it, it's more than just talking, hormones in, in, in particular, right? So now I really want to talk about precision medicine because I'd never really heard of this. And then we can talk about how we can use that to actually then show up more confident if that's what we want. Precision medicine is a relatively new area of medicine. You know, I've been practicing integrative and functional medicine for about the past 25 years. And what I realized, because my background is bioengineering, I realized that we could get so much more precise about your health individually. So what's happened in medicine is that we do medicine for the average. Mm. So we do all of these randomized trials, we do these big studies that look at the effect mostly of drugs as an intervention for a condition, Why? right? And so that then tells us whether a drug is better than a placebo, but it tells us the answer for a big population. In precision medicine, what we're interested in is the health of Lisa. So we're interested in the individual. We wanna know what's true for you. What are the symptoms that you're having? What are some of the interventions, starting first with diet, lifestyle, and nutrition to help you with those symptoms? So precision medicine is where we take all these different sources of data. So that includes your genetics. It includes biomarker testing like poop tests, blood work, urine testing. Of course, we're gonna look at your hormones. It includes wearables. So using things like, um, you know, I use rings, I use watches, I use a continuous glucose monitor. I've got one on right now. You know, the, the old way of doing it, Lisa, is that 
you would go to your doctor maybe once a year. Maybe you'd get a blood panel. We'd look at cholesterol. We'd do something like a metabolic panel and look at your fasting glucose. Hopefully we'd do a pap smear. And that was kind of it. But if you look at health, that visit once a year to a doctor, mm. that is not health. That is not tracking health. That is like less than 0.1% of your time. The rest of the time you're like out in the wild <laughs> doing your thing, eating food that you may or may not have told your doctor about. And so precision medicine allows us to take all these different data sources, put it together so that we can say for you, Lisa, okay, let's try this intervention for your gut. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have X symptom. Let's try these things to see if we can make your gut function better for you. But you get to define it. So you get to define what the goals are. You get to decide what health is for you and what you want your health for, your why. why. Mm -hmm. Rather than some doctor saying, okay, I want your uh, biomarker for your stool, you know, this calprotectin level to go down less than this number. <laughs> like how helpful is that? That is not very helpful. What's much better is for you to be in collaboration with a physician who can say, okay, here's what I'm seeing with your function and your health. How about working on these first three, three mm -hmm. things initially and setting up something called an N of one experiment where you serve as your own control mm -hmm. and we determine what's gonna be the best fit for you. And this is super important because if you look at things like antidepressants, if you look at Celexa, what we know is that you have to treat about 10 people for one person to benefit. If you look at statins, wow. which is one of the most commonly prescribed medications, usually you know for people who are older, you have to prescribe about 50 people with a statin before one benefits. Whoa! And that is medicine for the average. And so even with things like antibiotics, you know, with an N of one experiment, you can say, Okay, we're going to try an herbal therapy first for dysbiosis, mm. see how that works. We're going to try to nudge your progesterone if it's too low and your periods are getting closer together and you feel like you can't calm yourself down. Why don't we try chase tree mm. as an herb to raise your progesterone? Not by like using a sledgehammer to get your progesterone up, but by nudging the intelligence of the body so that it can get back into balance, into homeostasis. Ooh, I love everything you just said because go, when I had major gut issues, um, there were so many diets, there were so many people saying, try yeah. this. Oh my God, this really worked for me and this did amazingly well. And my husband swore by the ketogenic diet. So it's like, oh, okay, great. And you see the studies and you're like, I want that. Um, you know, so even the difference what you said about the studies being very generic and I get that that needs to be done. But then what you're talking about of going even deeper is so powerful because I think so many of us will look at someone else and say, well, this worked for them. And so, you know, why doesn't it work for me? And so that's actually one thing that I've been hesitant to give my advice of what I've done for myself, because going back to like my genetics, the environment that I've, you know, b was brought up in, the fact that, you know, I'm Greek and also, uh, um, had a bad relationship with food for 10 years, the fact that I overtook antibiotics. So all of that sort of thing then creates my situation. Yes. And so saying like, making sure that we're empowering people to take the ownership over and say, hey, what is the thing with, with you? And I loved, you caught me off guard and I didn't expect mm -hmm. you to say this, but your why, I love that. This is such an important missing piece because I think a lot of physicians make assumptions hmm. about your why. And they project it onto you without ever checking that assumption. So I think it's really essential that as consumers, as consumers of healthcare, that we're really clear about what our why is. I have a lot of Alzheimer's disease in my family. And you know, my grandmother was one of the closest people that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And I literally like watched her personality drain out of her. And it was like, it makes me misty to think about this. I don't, I don't wanna be like that. I miss her so much. And there's a legacy in my family of Alzheimer's disease. And what I want is to be like my great grandmother on the other side who came to my wedding, danced shamelessly with every man in the room. <laughs> 
go grandma. I had like this hot red suit on with like a polka dotted uh, scarf on her hat. That's what I want. That's my, that's my why. Like I want to go to my great grandchildren's mm. weddings mm. and be shameless, like be as bold as maybe I wasn't when I was younger. One of the things that happens after 40, and I'm curious if you've noticed this too, there's a way that the hormones of our menstrual cycle, because they change every single day, they make us more accommodating. Oh, what do you mean by that? Meaning that, you know, your estrogen and progesterone is kind of different every day. Testosterone too, it peaks around day nine to day 14. That's where, you know, most of us have the greatest sex drive. It's also where you can make the, the best nine muscle Nine to 14, gains. is that what you said? Everyone listening, nine to 14. <laughs> nine, to 14. nine to 14. Exactly. Sarah said it here. Yeah. <laughs> but that's also when you can have your best um, muscle gains. It's where you can race the fastest because if you're a you runner. Because you have the testosterone. You've got testosterone on Ooh, your side. You've sense. got estrogen that peaks around day 12. Progesterone is relatively lower compared to, you know, towards uh, a week before your period. So we we tend to be more accommodating. I think that's one of the sex differences that I see. Because we're, you know, every day is sort of different with our hormonal balance while we're still menstruating, we've got this, it's almost like a veil that kind of keeps us in a place of accommodation. And what I think happens after 40 is that veil starts to come off and we start to see, you know, I'm gonna speak my truth more. <laughs> I'm going to just say it. I'm going to put it out there because what am I waiting for? Mm. What am I waiting for? I'm 40. I'm not 40. I'm 54. Shut <laughs> up. I'm 54. I'm still cycling. I'm sorry. You're just going to have to give me a second for that. What the hell? Guys, if you're listening to this on podcast, you've got to go check out this woman. Oh, my God. I want to know everything you're eating, oh. everything you're doing. I'm going to follow everything you say. <laughs> Well, this is where that personalization is so important. And, you know, you were talking about having a difficult relationship with food as mm. a teenager, which I think is the story of probably 98% of women, right? I mean, so many of us have that where, I'll speak for myself, I used food for the wrong reasons. Mm. I used it for emotional reasons. When I was depressed, I would eat chocolate chip cookie dough. When I was happy, I would celebrate with... Uh, usually refined sugar. I just loved refined sugar. I would have fruit and vegetables and things like that too, but not quite the right doses of them. And I, ha I struggled with restriction when I was a teenager. I wasn't diagnosed with anorexia, but I was kind of close. And I remember my mother watching me lose all this weight when I was 15, 16. And she said to me, isn't it so great to have so much control? And I think about that now, I don't wanna blame my mother for no, saying this I because it. I think it was kind of the best that she could do under the circumstances. She had her own issues with food. But for me, food is not about control. It is about nurturing. It is about fueling ourselves in the best possible way and also personalizing it. Mm. So I take that point that she made that you're cautious about seeing what's worked for you because we're all different end of one experiments. You know, my physiology is very different than your physiology. We probably have some commonalities. I had SIBO, I had dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. But there's a way that we do need to personalize. I think that's so important. And you wanna work with a physician who can help you do that, mm -hmm. who works as a partner and not kind of this top down arrangement. So how do we start doing that? Let's say we don't even have a phys physician. Um, how do we start to see what food works for us? Um, and then I really want to get a little more detailed of like the recommendations that people can start to do to transition from refined sugar, realizing it's actually not you know, helping their hormones at all. Um, especially when, if you've had food issues, girl, like, right, like, let's just be honest. I'm always very aware that that part of me never just dies. And so as I start to think about, I want to better my hormones. How do I get better? Okay, focus on this. That can easily, at least with me, start to turn into a control, start to turn into an obsession. And while I'm convincing myself, I'm actually doing it for the good. No, no, you're, you're helping yeah. your hormones. Actually, I'm starting to go down now into a, a spiral. Such a good point. And I, I think, um, let's just be honest, this is messy. It is messy business. And you're right. 
that um, restrictor that I have as part of my personality, that, that um, young woman who wanted so much to be thinner and like, you know, be like one of the cheerleaders and be more popular and was a little chubby and sort of struggled with that. Like, I know that she's part of me. So yes, yeah, she's lurking in the shadows, but she also needs to be listened to and integrated mm. as part of this conversation because dismissing her doesn't work. I've learned that. Right. So I've got to befriend her and sort of win her over and, and also just make sure that I'm taking her needs into consideration. So where do you start? Um, so you mentioned this edge that I think is so important where on the one hand, we can frame it as I'm taking care of myself. I'm being so careful about getting my vegetables each day. And, you know, I'm eating my five different colors mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm, I'm eating this particular diet. So it's a little tricky. It can start to get into this place of what's known as orthorexia, mm -hmm. which is where you have an unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. So we want to be mindful of that. How do you do that? I think part of it is being um, really honest about your motivations. So starting with your why, so understanding what you want your health for. Yeah. I do precision medicine. So part of the way that I figure out with a, a client or a patient how to really optimize the food plan, it comes from looking at biomarkers. So I pretty much run a stool test on everybody. I'm looking at cortisol at at least four or five points during the day. I'm looking at food stress, like what foods are the ones that your body really integrates well versus the ones that you're having an immune reaction to. How can you test that? Let's say even they don't have the opportunity to, you know, do all of this. Like how, if I'm at home right now, how would I see, is it, do you have to look at the biomarkers and is that a very scientific thing or is there something that I can do where it's like, oh, I ate this today and I felt like this and I ate this and I feel like this? Great question. So there's a few ways to do it. The free way is an elimination diet. Mm. So an elimination diet where you cut out the, you know, the most common food intolerances, the ones that we tend to have the most reactions to, gluten, dairy, alcohol, sugar, uh, for some people, nightshades, mm -hmm. for some people, lectins. So you cut out the foods that are kind of the, you know, the, the ones that are the most problematic. You go off of them for some period of time. Usually the minimum is about three weeks. And then you start to reintroduce them. You have to add them back very slowly. So for instance, you add back dairy. And what I like to do is to add back sheep's milk first and see how you re react to it. I like to watch for reactions, usually for three days, Why sometimes four milk? days. Why out of curiosity? So sheep's milk and goat's milk has a little bit less inflammatory type of dairy. In it. So it's got more A2 compared to A1. It just mm. depends on you know what sort of animals you're getting the dairy from. So we know that you know most of us grow up exposed so much to cow milk. And so gluten and dairy are the two most common food intolerances mm -hmm. that we see, especially for someone who's got that frat party already happening in the gut, like I did, we're more likely to have these food intolerances. Mm -hmm. You know, peanuts, that's another common area. So you asked, okay, what can you do to figure out what some of these food intolerances are? So an elimination diet is the free way to do it, but you can also do some testing. So the way I like to test for it now is different, Lisa, than the way I used to test for it. So in functional medicine 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I would do a food intolerance test. So I'd look at IgG, IgA, you know, all these um, different ways that we, we react to food. And I would tell a patient, I'd get these long reports and I'd say, okay, you're intolerant to casein, the most common protein that's in milk. You're intolerant to gluten. You're intolerant to eggs. And so we would then come up with a way for them to do an elimination and then slowly introduce those foods after we do a period of gut rehab, mm. gut rehab. So mm. I just want to earmark that because this is such a juicy topic. Mm. The other thing that I do now that I think is actually more important is to measure leaky gut. So if you have leaky gut, which we call in medicine increased intestinal permeability, if you have leaky gut, it just means that those, you know, your 
the cells in your gut are supposed to be nice and tight, have these tight junctions between them. And when you start to lose that tightness, then foods and viruses, bacteria can pass through the integrity of the gut wall. And that's where the immune system is. So 70% of the immune system is right below the gut wall. And the immune system is just like, what the fuck? Like, what is happening? Why, why are we getting all these uh, stimulations from these foods that are supposed to be, you know, kind of passing through to the stool? So I test for leaky gut in pretty much all of my patients mm -hmm. because that's really the higher order business. In some ways, it doesn't matter what foods you're intolerant to as measured in the blood. We want to know if you have leaky gut. If you have leaky gut, we got to rehab that as a way for you to be able to tolerate more foods. Everything you just said, like it, it can, because I've gone through exactly what you're saying, I don't know if people realize how like important everything you just said was. I literally didn't realize how much everything you said I had. I had the SIBO, I had leaky gut, I had the parasite because my body was in just such disarray. It couldn't fight off any of the par parasite that I, you know, had had. So it was just like freaking all falling apart. And I honestly, I was tired all the time, in bad moods, like couldn't get my emotions um, stable. Um, so everything that you're saying is so important to going back to the why. If you want to show up confident, if you want to show up like a badass, if you want to show up and just be able to get through your day and enjoy it, if you want to be there for your friends and your family, whatever that thing is, it's so intertwined with everything you're talking about. And I love that you always say like, you need to eat for your hormones. That's such an important point. And, you know, I, I think a lot of folks don't realize that when it comes to your hormones, your food is the backbone of the hormones that you make. So if we look at sex hormones as an example, you have to have healthy fat. You have to have enough healthy fat to make those hormones. You know, when I was in medical school, I got totally grossed out in anatomy lab and I just like didn't want to eat meat. So I went vegan for a period of time. And I remember my boobs deflated like a couple of cup sizes. And I just, I didn't feel as well. I, I was depressed. I mean, yeah, I was working a lot in medical school, but it was only later that I connected the dots between the food I was eating, my hormones, and then my mood. So mm. I think connecting the dots is such an important piece. When you think about the control system for your hormones, which we want to keep in balance, we know that the gut is such an integral part of that. So we think of the control system, you know, definitely things start in the brain. So we've got a few places, the limbic system that kind of perceives threat in the environment. It's involved with your cortisol levels, your hypothalamus and the pituitary. Those are sensing kind of where you are with your hormones. If you restrict too much, like I did when I was a teenager, that can shut down some of the, the process in the brain and make you not ovulate. You might miss your period. And then those talk to a few glands in the body. They talk to the adrenal glands in the back, which produce cortisol, estrogen, testosterone, all of those hormones. They also talk to the ovaries in women, testes in men. Mm -hmm. But then the gut is part of this conversation. So she, if your gut isn't right, it creates this level of inflammation that can make you more likely to have depression, anxiety, panic attacks. Your hormones are such an important part of this. Mm -hmm. So food is the way that you can regulate your hormones. So the hormones I mentioned, but also insulin and leptin, some of the hunger hormones, the hormones that tell you, leptin tells you to, to put the fork down, ghrelin tells you to pick the fork up. So food really talks to these hormones. And we want to be thinking about, okay, what's the choice I'm going to make today for lunch or for dinner or for breakfast that's going to help me with regulating these hormones? Amazing. So um, talk to me actually about, go back to um, the fact that you noticed the fat. Because I, if I eat just meat, I don't even have to eat vegetables. If I eat really fatty beef, covered in olive oil with an avocado and olives, I'm good. Like I'm so full, I feel great. But I also have friends that are vegans and it is, um, a lot of it is they feel so much better on the vegan food mm -hmm. and eliminating. So for you, was it, oh, this doesn't work for me and so this is where I need to pivot and I need to reintroduce this into my life? 
That's right. So this is where the personalization becomes mm -hmm. so important because there's lots of people who are on a 100% plant-based diet and it really suits them. Right. So, you know, their biomarkers look good, their genetics help them kind of stay in hormonal balance with that particular food plan. And one of the things I like to say is that I'm food agnostic. So I think it's in some ways talking about food, Lisa, it's kind of like talking about religion or politics, it's so right? Cool. It's so loaded. But you know, I have plant-based patients, I have patients who are carnivores, I have patients who are pescatarian, I have all different types of patients. When you have learned that eating avocado, having a fatty piece of meat that's got um, extra virgin olive oil on it, you're getting so many polyphenols mm -hmm. from the extra virgin olive oil, one of the healthiest fats that we can possibly use to balance our hormones. When you have the avocado, which technically is a fruit, but it's it's so rich and it's also low in net carbs. So I like it personally for balancing my insulin and glucose. That's like in some ways kind of a perfect meal. So you've discovered that through some trial and error. But the other thing to keep in mind is that what is a perfect meal for you today might be different than 10 years ago, might be different than five years from now. So we have to we have to kind of keep an open mind about this pivoting process and discovering, okay, what's true for me right now? Oh my God, I love that because so how many people have you heard? I, you know, just from my friends, it's like, are you still be able to eat this? And now I can't. Um, so is that what's happening? That you're just, as you grow older, or as your body changes, your reaction to foods also change. And so we need to be very aware of it because I don't think at least like, I don't want to speak for everyone else, but at least for myself, before I ever really got into the health space, I always just thought, well, of course, if this works then, then it should work now. And so how do we start to tweak that um, with our eyes open? Because I think a lot of us want something to be true. And so we go down that path for maybe one or two years um, and we've missed all the signs along the way. Yeah, you said so many important things. So I want to highlight one thing and then we'll go to, okay, how do we, how do we decode this? Yeah. So you said something that I want to emphasize, and that is your body is sending you these messages. So you've gotten a lot of messages. You've gotten a lot of downloads over the course of your life. And we started with this, the way that women have such clear messages about what's going on in their body. And yet we're invalidated when we bring them to our doctors. So we're gaslit. We're um, told I don't think that's true. No, your hormones are fine. Oh, your gut is fine. So that's one piece that's important. We need to really honor these symptoms that we have. So these messages mm -hmm. that are coming from the body are crucial to decode. And that's where I think a collaboration with a physician who understands this way of working is so important. So the messages that you get now, I imagine are quite different than the messages you got as a teenager they change over time. Mm. But to me, part of the mystery, like the great mystery of all of this, is to notice how those messages change and to keep mining the depths of them to really understand what is going on in the body. What do you mean by mining the depths of them? Well, so I'll give an example. You know, I, I sometimes joke, Lisa, that I've had almost every hormone imbalance that a person can possibly have because <laughs> I've struggled. The perfect person to I'm the perfect person. I'm not one of those doctors who's got like perfect health and oh, never struggled with my weight, never struggled with my gut. I have struggled like most of my life. So, you know, one of the things that I found, for instance, when I had two kids in my 30s and then I really struggled with my weight, I went to my family doctor and said, you know, I've got PMS, I can't lose this baby weight, I'm struggling with my mood. At the time, I was, I was seeing a lot more patients. I was seeing like 30 patients a day, and I just was like so exhausted at the end of the day. I was also drinking more wine, and I kind of laid out this list of woes to my family practice doctor. And he said, oh, this is easy. You just need to exercise more and eat less. And then he said, you know, why don't we start you on an antidepressant? And while we're at it, why don't we put you on a birth control pill? Because it sounds like your issues are hormonal. So that was one of those moments, like those epiphanies that we have where I just was like, oh my God, did he just tell me to exercise more and eat less? He even wrote it on a whiteboard. Oh, like I, at first I was kind of ashamed, 
I had kind of that flush of shame. And then I realized, whoa, millions of women are being told this very same thing and it's wrong. It is wrong. So I left his office, I went to the lab, I checked my hormones. My cortisol was three times what it should have been, which was poking holes in my gut. I was drinking one or two glasses of wine every night, which was poking more, more holes in my gut. And I realized, okay, I got to take what I know about medicine and apply it to myself and then use what I learned to then take care of patients. So I take care of both men and women. But that's what really started me on this process of realizing that, okay, modern medicine kind of failed me. And if it's failing me as a physician, it's failing so many people. So that was the kind of anger and righteous indignation that I think can you know, really start a revolution. I hope it starts a revolution. But what, I, what I've realized since that time, I discovered that I really had to eat in a way that was personalized to me. So at that time I was eating a Mediterranean diet and I was gaining weight. It was too many grains for me. I was eating gluten, that wasn't working. I, uh, at the time I had an intolerance to dairy. I no longer have an intolerance to dairy. I was able to heal that. So I was able to go on an elimination diet and figure out what was gonna work the best for me. So you asked a question about, you know, how does this change over time? Like, is it getting older? Like what changes? Some of it's hormonal. So, you know, around age 35, that's when we reach kind of peak estrogen levels really? and then they start to decline. Hmm. We reach peak testosterone as women and men around age 28, and then it starts to decline more gradually with testosterone. So what I discovered was that I had to restrict my carbohydrates, not excessively. I still had to get a lot of vegetables, but that was really a way that I could adjust the Mediterranean diet to make it work for me. Then another thing that happens is sometimes our microbiome gets screwed up. So I got treated with the antibiotics mm -hmm. in 2017. I went through um, a surgery that required antibiotics for a month. I pleaded and begged to not get started on these antibiotics, ended up having to take them. And um, that wrecked my gut. In fact, I knew it would wreck my gut. So I tested my microbiome before mm -hmm. I took the antibiotics and I tested it afterwards. So I scienced myself. And I discovered that my diversity, you know, kind of the, the balance of different types of microbes in my gut went down by 87%. Oh my God. In one month. Ooh. One month. Now women get prescribed more antibiotics than men. We know this. And I feel like that's another major change that can set you up for needing something different when it comes to food as fuel and nurturance. So lots of things happen. We get older, you know, we've got stressful events. We've got these hormonal mm. changes that happen, especially 35 to 45. We've got um, antibiotics and other medications. We've got glyphosate in the environment. You know, that's another thing that can affect intestinal permeability. We've got toxins that we get exposed to. All of those things can change your hormonal balance mm. and also change what, what you most need from food to help to keep your hormones in balance. So after that month of antibiotics, and I know you know this story of like being on antibiotics and how much it just wrecks you. So after that, I could tolerate about seven foods. Yeah. Right? So I could eat cucumber, <laughs> I could eat salmon, I could eat tomatoes if I like removed the seeds and took the skins off. So I had only seven foods that I could eat. And that's when I was diagnosed with SIBO, I had dysbiosis, I had increased intestinal permeability. And that's when I actually started keto mm -hmm. for the first time and actually found that keto was very healing for me. We, we so, like, 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 not to interrupt you, but I'm like, oh, no, we have the same interrupt, story. Interrupt, because interrupt. that was exactly the same thing. I couldn't eat, I was down to, I think, four ingredients. It yeah. was like beef, salt, coconut oil, I think, and I think it was like chicken and something else. Yeah. Um, but it was like, it was first for six months, I could only do like four ingredients. And then it was just insane. And so everything you were saying, I just so relate to, and it just got worse and worse because I didn't understand. I didn't know what was happening to me. And so I think this conversation is so important for us all to realize how common it is. So common, so common. 
and not realizing that it was common, not realizing um, that I was doing it to myself, that I could start to change, that I could start to, you know, start to heal myself was just such a powerful thing. And you'd actually said this, Alan, it hit me so freaking hard. You said the shame. Yeah. The shame is exactly what held me back from getting help. Yeah. It was the fact that I did think that I was alone. It was the fact that at the time, Quest was just, you know, had just reached like one of, you know, the biggest nutrition companies in the world. And so here I am not able to eat our protein bars. It was, you know, not wanting people to see that my hair was falling out and the shame of that. And like, there's so much emotion around our hormones and with food and with things like that, that when you said it, it really did hit me. Um, and that's another reason why I love everything that you're doing is speaking up about this and like um, getting rid of the shame so that we can start finding the answers to that, what's happening. That is totally it right there. That is totally it. Because I think this is part of what we get trained into when we go through puberty. You know, in some ways, I think I was my most carefree before I went through puberty. Mm. Once we go through puberty and we've got breasts and hips and we start to get noticed more, you know, for how we look, that's where we start to develop, I think, this shame response mm -hmm. to the ways that we're not conforming to some ideal. So like our gut isn't working the way it's supposed to be ideally. Our moods are not working the way that they're supposed to be ideally. I don't even know what that is because we are programmed <laughs> to be moody. It is normal for women to be moody. I just want to normalize that right now. That is like totally cool. Like that is our superpower to use our moodiness, to use our willingness to speak our truth. And sometimes we get labeled as like a moody bitch. So what? So I want to undo that shame response, you know, for I want for our listeners to say, OK, what are the ways that I am biting my tongue or holding back from speaking my truth or talking about like how this bar is affecting my gut? We've got to be able to be really truthful and honest about that. That's like step one. Yeah, agreed. And I do think it also comes back to where we started with the gaslighting of the doctors is that, you know, saying to yourself when the doctor says to you, you know, X, Y and Z, this is what's, you know, what's wrong. If that doesn't feel true to you, to not feel the shame of speaking up and saying, hang on a minute, this doesn't feel right. Like I was so embarrassed that I hadn't had a period in over 10 years. I was so, right, because I'm just like, oh, well, I should be a female. I was so embarrassed that when my gut was literally too shit, I didn't have any sex drive. I wasn't sexual yeah. at all. I was shameful. I was completely embarrassed about all of that. And that was holding me exactly where I was in the situation. It was like, I couldn't climb out. I couldn't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel because I was so surrounded in the, the shadows of the, you know, of the shame, of the darkness, of how I was feeling about myself. But once I was able to just say, well, no, there's no shame around this, just own it. There's no shame around this, start speaking up, was how I started to shed that and actually take action. So beautiful, so beautiful, because you just connected the dots between shame and how that keeps us stuck. Mm. And it keeps us sick a lot of the time. So when we can speak our truth and when we can say to a doctor, OK, you're X, Y, Z. That doesn't jive with my experience like that just doesn't feel quite right to me. Can we keep investigating like we almost need to come up with scripts, mm -hmm. I think, for people to be able to to step into their power, especially with physicians and say, no, it feels like that misses the mark feels like you're not getting to the root of it. feels like you're not hitting on exactly what I'm trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. And how, how the hell do you do that in a seven minute appointment? I mean, you, you really, this takes time, right? It takes time to be able to let this unfold and to really be able to talk about, okay, this is what's going on with my gut. This doesn't feel right to me. Mm. And it goes back to having the confidence to do it. So you can almost like adjust your diet to gain the confidence that when you go into the doctor, you have the confidence to speak up because that was my problem. I was like, well, who am I to argue against this person? You know, they've got an MD at the end of the name. Like, I, you know, what do I know? And so I was always dismissing myself because of that. So when I went to the doctors because of my gut and people were like, oh, no, it has nothing to do with your hormones. And I'm like, but I haven't had the period in like, you know, 10 years. Does that have anything? to do with it. That's doctors, everything to do with oh, your hormones. Like, no, that's go to a gynecologist for that. I literally, they sent me, they wanted me to go to a different doctor. 
So I went to a different doctor because I thought, well, clearly this guy is right. He doesn't deal with that. So it must be something separate and I'll deal with these two things in isolation. Mm. But over time, as I started to go, this doesn't feel right. And I got the confidence and I started mm. to go, hang on a minute. And the ownership, mm. I would go to the doctors and the thing that like, was a marker in my life was when I went to the doctors because I was like, this isn't right. Like, let me just go to a gynecologist. She's very recommended. Let me just go to her. And I went there and she looks at my form and she's like, oh, you have PCOS. And I was like, oh my God, like my sister's had it. So, you know, I know it's quite common women, but I was like, there you go. That's the thing. And she goes, oh, but you don't want children. And I was like, no. And she goes, oh, it's okay. Then come back next year. Oh God. <laughs> and in that moment, oh. that very moment, I had put, everything came together. Mm. It was the ownership, mm -hmm. the trust your gut, mm -hmm. that this doesn't resonate with me. And then in that moment, I was like, oh, she has no idea what she's talking about. And that's when I was like, now you have to go, Lisa. You have to go and figure this out. But you can't listen to her. Mm -hmm. And I walked out of that doctor's uh, and I was like, the reality of the situation hit me. Yeah. And it was, she wasn't being ma malicious. She wasn't doing it because she was like, F you. She was doing it, in my opinion, of she'd learned so much. This was the script that she was given, that if something happens here, that th this means that. But it was enlightening to, for me to say, you cannot trust them. Yes. Which is also somewhat heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. I mean, it's heartbreaking to hear about it. And I want to generalize a few of the things that you said Please, yeah. for our listeners. So the first is feeling like you don't have the confidence to speak up with your doctor and even to challenge them on something they're saying to you. Sometimes the root cause of that is hormones. <laughs> so this does go back to hormones. Yeah. Sometimes your hormones being out of whack can make you feel like you don't have the confidence that you would otherwise have. Mm -hmm. So I want to normalize that because I want people to understand checking your hormones can help you with getting them back into balance where you have more agency <laughs> and confidence and you can be more of a badass. The second thing you said that I think is really important is that we began talking about ownership and being gaslit, but there's a way that you just talked about ownership in a new way. Um, you were talking about ownership as um, this epiphany that you had in her office where you realized that if I don't take this on, if I don't challenge you know, this dominant system of healthcare, I am disrespecting myself. Mm. And I think that's a really important part of ownership. Mm. So ownership is, of course, it's about not you know, being part of the drama triangle, like the drama triangle of the, the victim, the villain, the hero, because that doesn't solve anything. That's just like toxic stress that keeps getting passed around. Instead, we wanna step into our power. But a big part of stepping into our power is not just not allowing a physician to disrespect you, but to not, disres not do it to yourself, like not um, reinforce the habit by putting up with it. So that's big, that's really big. Now, you said something else, which just, this is the part that breaks my heart um, for you, as well as for the millions of women who've been told the very same thing, oh, you don't wanna get pregnant, see you next year. So we are taught in gynecology, I practice precision medicine, but I'm still board certified as a gynecologist. We were taught in our training that if a woman has PCOS, you ask one question, do you wanna get pregnant or not? If they wanna get pregnant, then we do this massive hormone panel. We look at everything. We look at you know, estrogen, progesterone, the hormones that control estrogen and progesterone. We look at cortisol, we look at insulin, we look at glucose. We go through this entire battery of tests if you wanna get pregnant. If you don't wanna get pregnant, how about a birth control pill? So that is devastating. It is devastating and it's a double standard. Mm. It is a double standard because medicine is set up to reinforce fertility in women. And so I can tell you there are women listening to us right now who've gone to their doctor and have said, hey, I'm 42, 
I feel like things are changing with my hormones or I haven't had my period for X amount of time. Could we run a hormone panel? And a lot of those women are told, no, we don't run hormone panels. They change too much. It's not worth it. But if that woman wants to get pregnant, we'll run the hormone panel. So we cannot put up with that anymore. What is that saying to us women? Like literally by saying, oh, totally. if you do not want children, your health doesn't matter. Totally. Your health only matters if you are going to procreate. Like that is absolutely saying me, Lisa, I am less valuable because I've chosen not to have children. I mean, that is exactly what the message that they are saying to women. Well, we have to call bullshit on it. Agreed. We totally have to call. And so this is the conversation that we are changing because... We cannot tolerate this behavior any longer. And I wish I could say that medicine is changing, that you know, there's more of kind of this new generation of doctors, people who are educating other doctors and kind of getting them to understand mm-hmm. some of these things. But I would say it actually is on us as consumers. So it's not gonna come top down. We have to change it. Yeah. Grassroots, these conversations, the work that you do, Women of Impact, we have to change this. And um, there was one other piece that you mentioned that I wanna uh, Please, yeah. emphasize. And that is when you were talking about your gut with one of those doctors and they said, oh, your period has nothing to do with what's going on with your gut, go see the gynecologist. <laughs> this is the way that medicine operates. It has these silos where you see the gastroenterologist, they're like, don't, la la la, don't talk to me about your period, go see mm-hmm. the gynecologist. The gynecologist is like, la la la, don't talk to me about your gut. One of the most important ways that your estrogen is regulated is in the gut. <laughs> the amount of fiber that you get, the, um, the, the number of particular bacteria that you have in your gut. Those, those, there's certain bacteria that produce an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. I know it's like ner- <laughs> nerd alert. I love it. Uh, BG. You know, those particular bacteria that produce this enzyme regulate your estrogen levels. Mm. So if you have a problem with that particular type of bacteria, it's going to change your estrogen levels. We know that people that eat more plants have different estrogen levels than people who eat more meat. Mm. So your gut and your estrogen levels are intricately involved. So I just wanted to spell that myth right now. Yeah, I love that. And the, um, I can't remember what you call it, but there's uh, the nutrigenomics. Is that correct? Am I saying the word right? You got it. (laughs) You nailed it. Um, Talk to me a bit about that because I actually found that fascinating. Nutrigenomics is super interesting. What we know is that your genetics really predict a lot of your response to food and to nutrients. And You know, in some ways, when I went through medical school, that was when they were doing the Human Genome Project. And when we published the first human genome, we thought that would really revolutionize medicine. But the party kind of never happened. I mean, it's it's really been very slow to see the integration of genetics into medical practice Mm -hmm. in a way that's really valuable. What happened was a lot of direct-to-consumer testing became available, and then Unfortunately, a lot of companies would say, oh, you have this gene, MTHFR, and so you should take this supplement. Mm -hmm. And that's not really the way that genetics works. You've got to be thinking with a different mindset, which is pathways. Like what's going on with your inflammation pathway? Mm -hmm. What's going on with your detoxification pathway? What's going on with the oxidative stress pathway, which is kind of like rust in the body? What's going on with your... Uh, methylation pathway, which one of the things it does is inactivates estrogen. So then again, estrogen very oh. important in terms of nutrients. Mm. It also is involved in systems like your cholesterol, your vascular system, your brain health, your risk of mood issues, your risk of autoimmunity. So nutrigenomics is the part of genetics where we can really predict the way that your blueprint, your genetic blueprint will respond to certain foods and nutrients. So for example, I've got some issues with my methylation pathway. So I'm just not very good at eating dark green leafy vegetables and extracting the B vitamins that I need. So I just, you know, my enzymes work about uh, 50 to 70% less than someone who's got totally normal genetics. Mm -hmm. 
So I have to take a supplement. I do need to take some methylated B vitamins. I also eat a lot of those green leafy vegetables, probably more than uh, the average person needs to. It also can predict, for instance, your response to gluten or your response to choline, which is a really important nutrient that you find in eggs and chicken. It also predicts your response to salt. So some people can eat salt. It doesn't affect their blood pressure at all. Other people like my mother eat salt and it raises her blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So that's the exciting part of nutrigenomics. It also tells you about your response to caffeine. So many different things. We're still exploring a lot of this. But the important piece to mention, I think, is that genetics is part of the story. Environment is a bigger part of the mm. story. So the way that we sometimes think of it is that genetics loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. I didn't come up with that. Someone else came up with that. But it's, it's important to realize that you've got this blueprint, but you have a lot of workarounds and like ways that you can deal with your genetic blueprint. So for instance, my family history of Alzheimer's disease one of the reasons why I love the ketogenic diet is because I can fuel my brain with ketones. When I'm in ketosis and my body is burning fat like I am right now, it's like I hear the angels singing because my brain loves ketones. And another thing that happens for women after the age of 40 is that 80% of us don't do as well burning glucose in the brain. So this is known as uh, the technical term for it is cerebral hypometabolism. The way I describe it to my patients is that after age 40, 80% of women have kind of this slowdown mentally. And I find that often a ketogenic diet, a well-formulated, clean ketogenic diet is a great workaround. Mm. So it's a way of dealing with some of those genetics that I have that make me more insulin resistant make me more programmed to have prediabetes, which I had in my 30s. So that's another reason why I love the ketogenic diet. And that's what uh, nutrigenomics can tell us. Oh my God, I love that. And that quote that you said, I know that it's not yours, but it's so freaking powerful about the fact, and I didn't want to interrupt you, but genetics load the gun, food pulls the trigger. That's so powerful because here's what I, I never want to, um, have an excuse. Like I personally never want to have an excuse. And it used to be the excuse, well, it's my genetics, right? It must be my genetics. It was the way that, you know, if did my mum breastfeed me or not? What did my mum eat? It's got nothing to do with what I eat on a daily basis, right? <laughs> so it's like, that was so freaking powerful because now it allows everyone to understand that what they're putting in their body can actually activate the gene that they're worried about or that they don't want or not activate it and that like everything you're saying to me knowledge is power like period knowledge is power so by telling me that when i get into 40 that this is going to happen that when i'm in my 20s this is going to happen if i take contraception this is what's going to happen and you even said it again at the beginning with the contraception it's like at, at least if we know hey if you take this this is going to happen this may happen go into it with your eyes open. And then that way we have the power, which to me, that is what the show's about, is having the power to be the hero of our own lives. And with the book, with everything you've just been talking about, to me is exactly that, is that you're giving the power over to the people so that now they can show up with the choice of how they want to show up. And if that is, like, I just want to live till I'm 50 because I love ice cream so much, I'm the type of, go freaking ham. Like, I don't care, that's the life that you choose but at least go into it knowing that this is what is going to happen. Well, we've almost come full circle, haven't we, Lisa? Because you were asking me at the beginning, okay, how do we step into our power? Mm, yeah. Like when we're getting gaslit, when we're getting dismissed by our doctors, how do we step into our power? And in some ways that idea that genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger, food pulls the trigger with nutrigenomics. What we know is that that environment is under your control. Mm. Like so much of it is under your control. The choices you make with food, the time that you go to bed tonight, you know, the amount of morning sun that you get, the, um, the people that you feed yourself with, you know, like amazing people who you can talk to about these things like shame. You know, mm. Brene Brown did this beautiful interview where she was talking about the kind of people that you wanna share your shame story with. She almost, she's got this quote about it, like the people that, you know, would help you with uh, a dead body. <laughs> <laughs> As often we need people to help us with Right, those. exactly. I mean, she's making the point, of course, she's so funny that, you know, these are people that you're willing to be open and vulnerable with. Yeah. 
we need those people in our lives. That's a big part of, you know, what we need to be feeding ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that idea that you're not just stuck with your genetics with like some particular, uh, uh, you know, set of uh, conditions that you're stuck with, that you have so many options for how you can manage your environment and work around the genetics. I think that's so promising. And that's what I want people to really hear that probably the most influential thing when it comes to your gut is your food, Mm -hmm. the choices you make with your food. Second would be stress. Third would be medications. But I think understanding that so much of this is within your power, that's such an empowering message. Yeah, God. Where can people find your book? Where can people find everything that you're doing? So you can find the book anywhere books are sold. Um, you can also go to my website, sarahgottfriedmd.com. Amazing. Guys, guys, you got to go check her out. you got to read the book. She has recipes. She breaks it all down. She has stories. Go check it out. If you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Bilyeu. And if you're not subscribed, guys, click that subscribe button down there. And until next time, be the hero of your own life with your hormones. Peace out.